Tonight on The New Reality. A little note to people that go to the grocery store. Supply and demand. Don't lose faith in the food chain. It just needs a little bit of fixing. Tracing our future. We tend to be very slow adopters of any new technology like that. This could be a good opportunity for us to be a bit bolder. Survival of the fittest. Just before I got here, I was running to complete a marathon next year. And now I can't even get up without losing my breath. Pregnant in a pandemic. The midwives are wearing masks. There's no one else in the waiting room. And if I get COVID now, I won't be able to be there for the birth of my child. And rising to the challenge. It can be like kind of an emotional roller coaster. Oh, it's all about the crust, isn't it? Hello, I'm Donna Friesen. We've all had our lives disrupted in ways we never expected. And this pandemic has made us consider more deeply many things in our lives we used to take for granted. The comfort of hugging your friends, the joy of dinner out in a restaurant, and the steady supply of an abundance of food. Those who work the land, plant the crops, harvest the fields, raise the animals, catch the fish, they keep the world fed and we're accustomed to getting what we want when we want it. We always assume the food producers will be there and that shelves will be stocked with food from all over the world. This pandemic has exposed the vulnerabilities of our food supply chain. What happens when workers get sick and when processing plants close down, when migrant workers no longer show up? David Aiken looks at the impact. <laughs> Southern Alberta, cattle country. To me, there's not a prettier place in the world. We're right on the edge of the foothills. Bob Lowe and his family have been on these grasslands for more than 100 years. I guess cattle are kind of in, in my blood. Both sides of the family have been in the cattle business since before the turn of the century. But times have rarely been as tough. Lowe and other beef cattle ranchers are running out of room on their farms. The problem? The handful of meat packing facilities that process the country's beef are running well under capacity, as those plants struggle to keep their workforces free of COVID-19. Yep, no, that's, that's the bottleneck. The Cargill plant just up the road from Lowe's Ranch has been the most high profile processor to run into trouble, but there's similar issues for beef ranchers, hog farmers, and poultry growers all across the country. Animals that should have been shipped to market weeks ago continue to grow and continue to cost thousands of dollars every day to feed. Lowe made it through the BSC or mad cow crisis of the early 2000s, but this crisis is one for the ages. I think mentally it's probably worse. After Mad Cow hit, 27,000 beef farmers packed it in, and 5 million acres of grassland pasture disappeared, sold to developers or put to other uses. And that crisis was a relatively simple one to fix. Canada just had to get its beef back to foreign markets. This thing, it's global in nature for one thing, so, you know, half of our production goes out of country but this is affecting those, those other countries too. So what that's going to do in the end, we don't really know. I mean, we've got demand for our product is there. Can it get there? We have no idea. On the other side of the country, in the outport of Bay Bulls, just south of St. John's, Jason Sullivan readies his Atlantic Outlaw for the crab fishery that's about to open. I fish and crab about, uh... I guess off and on, like since I'm a kid, but uh, you know, full time in the last 20 years. Those who farm the sea are also facing stiff economic headwinds. The Atlantic Outlaw can hold 30,000 pounds of crab that would have fetched as much as six bucks a pound before the pandemic. The crab is a high-end product sold to casinos, cruise ships, restaurants, markets that have all crashed. Now, Sullivan might get three bucks a pound. Then you got your bait cost, which is uh, two fifty a pound, which is so the price of bait is nearly as much as we're getting for for the the crab we're catching. Then there's the cost of fuel, food, mortgage on the boat. For some fishermen, it might not even pay to put their boats in the water this year. And meanwhile, there's the challenge of keeping fishing crews safe from COVID-19. Sleeping quarters for eight are below decks, 
and it's mighty snug. It's certainly not to reach Carlton. No. And the galley for Sullivan's crew, well, it's a tight squeeze if everyone's at the table at once. It's just like a little camper, really. Health authorities have issued some guidelines for fishermen. Well, it's not even practical even to have these rules for us. Uh, you know, they don't work. It's just impossible to do what the distance on a boat. Sullivan says other suggestions were absurd. And it was kind of embarrassing by it, to be honest with you. I mean, like, don't share the same toothbrush and stuff like that. And I mean, my God, I mean, you know, we are living in rural Newfoundland, but, you know, we might have grown up in the woods, but we didn't need the bushes. We don't, we don't, uh, we don't share the same toothbrushes or anything in general. So I don't know why, you know, but that's the kind of stuff that they came out with. Back on land at the country's vegetable and fruit farms, the safety challenge is a bit more manageable. Masks, gloves, and sanitization. But these farmers have a different problem, a labor shortage. Nick DiGirolamo and his family have been growing veggies and herbs since the early 1960s. It's, it's, it's a life, okay? You, you've done this your whole life. Like I mean, my brother and I, my, and my son, and my dad still, he's 95, and he's still on the property. and. Uh, we, we work seven days a week, okay? Even Christmas Day, I show up here. But during planting season, that's right now, and during harvesting, DiGirolamo and his family cannot do it all themselves. They bring in highly trained workers from Mexico. We need them, that's all there is to it. We can't not get Canadians to do the work on a continuous basis. Normally, more than 25,000 temporary foreign workers help Canada's farmers every year. Most come from Mexico, but also from Caribbean and other Latin American countries. They do jobs that Canadians will not do or cannot do. Everybody says you're getting unskilled labor, but they're not unskilled labor because they've been coming here and doing the same jobs for years, okay, and coming back to the same farms. And they know how to pick an apple and how to treat it gently. They know how to pick a berry without squeezing it. They know how to pick a tomato without sticking their fingernails in it. This is Ishmael's eighth year working for Nick. It's a good person, good boss, it's a good, good friend. But this year, several thousand of those vital agricultural workers just are not coming to Canada because of the pandemic. And those that did come had to be quarantined for 14 days at the expense of their employers. The shortage of agricultural workers and their delay in getting to Canada means that some crops simply did not get planted. I think there's going to be a shortage of fresh fruits and vegetables in, in, in the fall. Meanwhile, back at the ranch, Bob Lowe tries to put it all in perspective. A, a little note to, to our customers, to the people that go to the grocery store and buy our product, it's perfectly safe. We've got a problem getting it to you, but that'll be fixed and and don't lose faith in the in the food chain. It's still there. It just needs a little bit of fixing. Getting things fixed, getting back to normal and reopening the economy will require three key things. More testing to catch outbreaks before they get out of control. Contact tracing to identify anyone an infected person came in contact with and isolation to break the chain of transmission. Test, trace, isolate is the mantra. And it's the tracing part where the right to individual privacy collides with the need to protect public health. South Korea has led the world in successful contact tracing. As Jeff Semple explains, it's required some trade-offs not everyone is comfortable making. South Korea offers a glimpse of a brighter future. Crowds returning to amusement parks, the movies, even the airport, as though the country just woke up from a strange dream. It feels great to be out with my family, he says. We are still cautious, but it looks like the containment efforts are going well. South Korea was one of the first and hardest hit countries by the COVID-19 pandemic. But after two months of strict social distancing, on Wednesday, it relaxed the rules. And since then, there have been almost no new cases. The government had prepared. I think that's the most important thing. Dr. Jerome Kim is the head of the International Vaccine Institute. 
He points to his country's outbreak of another coronavirus, MERS, in 2015, that spurred the government to introduce new emergency powers, allowing it to harness credit card records and smartphone GPS locations to track and retrace the movements of COVID-19 patients. Although you're tracked, you're still anonymous. Um, and, and it's really the government and, and and the people who might have been exposed to who find out. The anonymized data is used to identify hotspots and in smartphone apps to alert users about cases nearby. You really don't do well with this. Um, whoops, so that's the alarm. During our interview, Lee's own smartphone sounded an alarm, alerting him that a COVID-19 patient had visited his neighborhood bar called King Club Zero at a specific time. And if you had a fever of 37.5 and weren't going to work and you knew that you'd been at King Club Zero, um, you know, you'd go in for testing. And they piped, they probably would put you in isolation. Similar apps have been deployed in more than 25 countries, from Australia to the UK. But what about Canada? We're ready to go. We have a product that can be deployed in a matter of days. Daniel Lee's Vancouver-based company pitched their contact tracing app to several provinces, including Ontario. Unfortunately, we just uh, didn't see the traction um, on the public sector side. For the most part, Canada is still doing contact tracing the old-fashioned way. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. Health professionals and volunteers calling a COVID-19 patient's contacts one by one. So that we can connect with them, find out if any of them are symptomatic and get them tested. Otherwise, they need to be isolating and that's the instruction we provide to them. But that system is far from perfect. First, I got the call from uh, the hospital telling me I got positive. This Vancouver actor tested positive and says health officials asked him for a list of his contacts. And then and then I told her uh, what I've been doing, went to the gas station. But an employee at that gas station told Global News they never received a call from public health and had no idea a COVID-19 patient had been there. It's going to require many, many, many people to be able to follow up with all of those positive tests. And that's a part where I think we're particularly vulnerable because no public health unit has the resources to do that right now. A contact tracing app would automate that process, but there's a catch. Most of the apps on offer require access to a smartphone's GPS location, allowing the government to track a person's movements and sparking concerns over privacy. If you know that uh, as of tomorrow, the government has a trace on everywhere I've been and all the people I've come in contact with. Um, you may not want to live in a country like that. For a contact tracing app to be effective, studies suggest at least 60% of the population needs to opt in. If you have large swaths of Canada that look at these applications with suspicion, that look at these apps as um, injurious to their way of living, they will not use them. But a solution may be in sight. Google and Apple are now building a framework that will allow contact tracing apps on their devices to use Bluetooth technology. The Bluetooth signal would locate other phones nearby that are running the same app. So say you'd visited a restaurant and the person at the table next to you were to test positive, you'd receive an alert. But your data would be encrypted and never leave your phone unless you tested positive and consented. Apple has walked me through on two occasions all of what they've done in terms of the tech and the privacy preserving features and no geolocation data and everything. And so I can give my vote of confidence to it. Download AB Trace together, turn on your Bluetooth and make- Some apps like the one released just last week in Alberta already employ Bluetooth technology, but without software support from the tech giants, they've been plagued with problems. Really, I think most serious app developers at the moment have to wait until Google and Apple implement their technical infrastructure in their smartphones. The Google Apple app support should be ready later this month, but most governments in Canada still have not authorized any apps to use the technology. Health experts warn the longer the wait, the greater the risk. As we tend to be very slow adopters of any new technology like that. We wait until the rest of the world has done it and then we gingerly put our toes into the water. Uh, you know, this could be a good opportunity for us to be a bit bolder. I mean, people, if they don't know by now, they should know that their location is being tracked on their phone 24-7, and most people have not turned off the uh, location uh, switch 
on their phone, um, and it's used for all sorts of things right now, typically for marketing. Hey, if it's used for marketing, uh, using it for good to try to prevent deaths seems like a more noble cause, and so why wouldn't we be okay with that? The more restrictions are lifted, the greater the need for contact tracing and testing. And experts warn Canada is currently lacking in both. We keep hearing those most at risk from COVID-19 are the elderly, and that's true, but there are exceptions. Georges Laroc is a big exception. He's 43 years old, six foot three, and fit. Georges Laroc is a former NHL enforcer. For 12 seasons, he was one of the toughest guys on the ice. He does have asthma, but he says he's the kind of guy who rarely gets sick. And yet, this is where he ended up in early May, in a Quebec hospital, diagnosed with COVID-19. Just before I got here, I was running uh, to complete a marathon next year, uh, five, six days a week, 10 kilometers every day. And now I can't even get up uh, without losing my breath. It, it's insane. I wake up in sweats all the time. And uh, uh, <coughs> you know what? I'm not the only one fighting this, so don't feel sorry for myself. It's okay. With pneumonia in both lungs, he spent five days in the hospital and is now recovering at home in self-isolation. And Georges Laroc is feeling well enough to talk to us today. Georges, thanks for doing this. Did you ever for a second imagine you'd be one of the people who ended up in the hospital with COVID-19? I actually thought it was blown out of proportion and I never thought I was gonna get it. There's no way. I, I, I thought it was only affecting older people and that uh, if I was going to get it, I was not going to have any symptoms. Well, it came back and blew me right in my face because uh, I ended up in the hospital and uh, brought me a, a big piece of humility. Yeah, well, I know you had trouble breathing. Uh, you had a fever. Tell us what it felt like to go through the symptoms. Well, you know, at the beginning, I had chills. And, uh, you know, I was in bed. I, I totally wet my bed. When I woke up in the morning, I was like, what's going on? My body, I'm never sick. And my breathing started to be a bit hard. And uh, I went to the hospital because it was weird. I didn't know why I was feeling this way. And I wanted to get checked because I was delivering food to elderly people. And I'm like, if I'm sick, I need to tell them. So when I went to the hospital, they did an x-ray and then they checked me out. And they were like, oh, we don't need you to do the test. Uh, your lungs are a bit, uh, a bit swollen. So they gave me some cortisone pill. They sent me home. But then my swelling and my uh, breathing was getting worse and worse. And when you have asthma, you're a bit, a bit worried when your breathing is a bit harder because you wonder what's going to happen and you never want it to stop. But then the hospital calls me back and they said, the doctor made, made a mistake in your x-ray and you have pneumonia. I'm like, what? So I end up going back to the hospital on Thursday and things were, my breathing was much harder. And I was mad when I was at the hospital. I was like, listen, I need a test. I need to tell the elderly if I'm sick so they could go get checked. So they did a test and then they said, yes, you have it and you have pneumonia in your lungs, and they plug me to the uh, oxygen that, that went through my nose. And Just take me back to the first time you went to the hospital and you asked for a test, and, and they said no. W what reason did they give you? They said that they didn't have enough, and they need to save them, and whether I have it or not, it wasn't important. I'm like, yes, it is important, because there's elderly people that needs to know my status. So the second time, mm -hmm. when I was so mad and I asked for it, they were like, well... You know, knowing that, they should have did it the first time. I'm like, so they didn't even agree with the fact that they didn't do it the first time. It was so weird. But at least I'm happy that uh. all the elderly that I was delivering food to, they all got tested because I was positive, and they oh, were they all did. negative. So that's yes. a relief. But what do you think that the fact that you didn't get a test initially, that there was this confusion, says about the sort of system in Quebec about testing people? The, the test system here is no good. It, it, it's no good. It makes zero sense. Me, if I was delivering food to elderly people, it means I'm, I'm doing a job that is essential. If I can't even get tested so they could be safe, what does that say to others? When I was at the hospital and I was talking to the nurse, you know what they told me? The nurse that are going to war every single day to help out the people that, that are suffering from COVID, they said, George, we feel so bad because before we go home, we can't even get tested to know if we're bringing the disease at home to our family. Do you have any idea where you picked it up? Yeah, I do. Um, when I was doing all the grocery shopping, I have this bad habit every time I put my hair back to touch my face. I always do that. 
now I'm going to have to wear an elastic because when you go to a grocery store, you wash your hand in your car and your Purell before you start driving. But I touch my face maybe 20, 30 times before I even wash my hand because I'm always putting my hair back like this. And when you touch it, when you're grabbing stuff, it's the worst thing. And again, I didn't think it was that contagious. So I was doing it anyway. But now I know. George, if you uh, felt before like you were never going to get this disease or if you did, you wouldn't get very sick. What message do you have now for people who are your age, have your fitness level, who might also think that they're almost immune? Well, you know, what I would say to them is that take this seriously. And, and if, if not for yourself, knowing that you're young, you might recover from it. But if from the people around you, because you don't know who you're going to be in contact with. But maybe you'll be in contact with, with somebody that their immune system is not strong enough. Maybe somebody that is recovering from cancer. And that's what you have to think about. Still ahead on the new reality, the rise of baking. How old is your starter? My starter? What do you mean? The questions and answers about our new love for bread making. And... Not so easy. Green, killing it up there. She's biking for two. What to expect when you're expecting in a pandemic. Well, the midwives were wearing masks. There was no one else in the waiting room. It just had a totally different feel. And up next, discovering a vaccine is one thing, making it is another. How will everyone who needs it get it? Humankind has never faced a more urgent task on a tight timeline and defeating COVID-19. A vaccine is what everyone is waiting for and counting on to allow us to be in close contact with each other again. But everyone will have to be vaccinated, more than 7 billion people. And ideally, it will have to happen quickly so we don't end up with some countries' economies back on track while others wait and continue to suffer. So discovering a vaccine is the first challenge. The second is manufacturing it. I'm delighted to get the ball rolling it was almost like a telethon. The European Commission mobilizes 1 billion euros. A virtual summit of world leaders collaborating to fund the creation and production of a vaccine for COVID-19. It's humanity against the virus. We're in this together and together we will prevail. Billions were promised in three hours. Usually a vaccine takes... The Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation alone committed $100 million. COVID-19 has reminded us that viruses don't obey borders or customs laws. They don't care about what nationality you are. Absent, though, were the U.S. and Russia, a sign that not only is creating a vaccine a massive challenge, so is the prospect of world leaders fighting the pandemic while fighting each other. Und Deutschland stellt sich dieser Verantwortung. We must share, says Germany's Chancellor. In ogni parte del mondo, Universal access must be guaranteed, says the Pope. In the race for a safe and effective vaccine, multiple horses are in the running. More than 100 teams of researchers in at least 21 countries. There is no guarantee of a winner. If there is, the whole world will cheer and then every country will want the vaccine immediately. Whoever creates it will likely control it. The next step will be producing the vaccines in a sufficient number to uh, inoculate uh, everyone or almost everyone. Uh, that is something that we are preparing already uh, in terms of manufacturing and, and production capacity here in Canada because we know that uh, countries around the world will be producing for their own citizens first and we need to be part of that as well. The scale of what's needed is daunting. More than 7 billion doses produced and distributed. I can't imagine there is any country in, any country in the world with a, a, a production facility that could turn out billions of doses in a reasonable time frame. We have to figure out, can we manufacture it? Do we have the vials? Do we have the syringes? Do we have the needles? Right now, the answer is no. Plus, not all vaccines are produced the same way. The vaccine is the most likely solution. And... So great scientists are rushing to get that done. That's why Bill uh, Gates, the biggest funder of vaccines in the world, is proposing spending billions to build seven different factories for the leading vaccine candidates. If one is successful, it can go straight to the factory right away. The sooner the better. There are 100 efforts, but maybe 10 of those uh, should get the resources to build factories and go full speed ahead. 
Then the vaccine has to be carefully packaged, possibly refrigerated, and shipped all over the world. This is the world's largest vaccine producer, the Serum Institute of India. It rolls out more than 1.5 billion doses of vaccine a year. It has signed on with a group of the front runners for a COVID-19 vaccine, but has made it clear India will come first. In the U.S., Johnson & Johnson has signed partnerships, promising to deliver a billion doses of a potential vaccine next year. Elsewhere, the sheer scale of the task has brought pharma giants and rivals together. GlaxoSmithKline and Sanofi have united, aiming to produce hundreds of millions of doses. But there have been signs, too, of underhanded tactics. In March, a German news report claimed American President Donald Trump tried to buy exclusive rights to a potential vaccine being developed by CureVac, a leading German biotech firm. The CEO abruptly left the company, and the company later insisted there was no offer from Trump. And then there's Operation Warp Speed. The president's Made in America plan to have at least 300 million doses of vaccine available in the U.S. by January. We're going to fast track it like you've never seen before. With China also a front runner in the race for a vaccine, comes deeper concerns the urge to hoard might further flare tensions with the U.S. The contribution of China and the United States both uh, to fight COVID-19 is, in my opinion, absolutely essential. The world already knows the pitfalls of everyone chasing the same limited supply. The shortage of personal protective equipment and the hoarding by some countries cost thousands of lives. And it's led to a new awareness about the need to be self-sufficient. And who's to say the same protectionist impulses, the frantic bidding wars, the overall erosion of trust, won't plague the infinitely more complicated mission to vaccinate. It really depends on, on what the nature of the vaccine is. But no, there are not a lot of places in Canada with, with the capacity. And to, to ship 35 million doses in a, a reasonable time frame is it's just logistically and technically very difficult. We're still learning about this virus, but if it's taught us anything, it's that an outbreak anywhere is a threat to everyone. It's never timely enough in, in an outbreak session. What, what I see, what I hear, what I feel, what I also feel myself, is that people are doing their, really the very best and beyond to, to be as quick as possible. Improvements in public health have been one of the great triumphs of modern times. Life expectancy on average now is greater than ever before. Childhood mortality has dropped. Terrible diseases banished. And vaccines, like the one for polio, have been revolutionary. That's another lesson. Jonas Salk, who developed the polio vaccine, refused to patent it. Who owns the patent on this vaccine? Well, the people, I, I would say, there is no patent. This is, could you patent the sun? <laughs> it belonged, he believed, to the people. If a vaccine is discovered for COVID-19, the reality is not everyone will get it at the same time. It could take months or years to produce 7 billion doses, and there will be many dilemmas, including who should get it first. Dr. Seth Berkley is CEO of Gavi, an international vaccine alliance that works to bring public and private sectors together to create equal access to vaccines. He's a medical doctor and an epidemiologist, and Dr. Berkley is in Geneva. Creating a safe and effective vaccine is a big enough challenge, and we know many of the best scientists in the world are working nonstop on that right now. Assuming we get one, what about manufacturing it? Does the capacity exist right now? Part of it depends by the time the vaccine is ready is who it will need to be used in. And so if we're talking about the entire population of the world, it obviously also depends on is it one dose, two doses? What's the type of manufacturing it is? That's all going to affect how quickly we can scale up which is why today we need to prepare for that. And so what we're trying to do is ask, what's the manufacturing capacity that exists across the world now? How much of that is can be repurposed? Because of course, we don't wanna stop routine vaccines. In fact, right now, one of my greatest battles is how to keep routine vaccines going, because if we were to stop routine vaccines to prevent coronavirus, 
cases, for example. For every death you'd prevent from coronavirus, you'd have 101 deaths from existing vaccine preventable diseases. So we're trying to look at what that capacity is. And then, of course, the next step will be to try to make that capacity available to whichever are the best vaccines in the world so we can scale up rapidly. Mm-hmm. Why is it important for wealthy countries to make sure that developing countries also get the vaccine? That's a great question. I mean, you know, from one sense, you can say it's a humanitarian imperative because we all are on this planet together. But there's also a self-interest, which is we saw this virus was able to move from a small um, community in Wuhan um, to um, 180 countries over the course of three to four months. That shows how fast infectious diseases can move. So if we want to protect our countries, our family, we need to stop this disease spread wherever it is in the world. And that's why we have to take a global perspective. We know what happened with uh, ventilators and personal protection equipment, the competition for dwindling supplies, countries outbidding each other. Could that play out again with a vaccine? That's why we have to start planning now, because if we don't plan, if we don't agree, if we don't have these discussions, that's exactly what will happen. And it's not just on the access to the vaccine. It's also the quality of the science. Science is global. And what you want is a situation where the best science in the world gets made available to everyone in the world, not the best science in one country or the best in one company. You want us to be searching the world for the best vaccines and making those available. And that's why we need global cooperation. No vaccine has been made for any coronavirus from the common cold to SARS. Can we be sure there will be one for COVID-19? Well, of course, the answer is until we have one, we can't be certain. Uh, Most of my vaccinologist friends um, who worked on SARS and others feel that um, this is a technically feasible vaccine and that um, we will be able to solve that problem. But of course, what we don't know yet is do you get long term immunity to this virus? That's going to be an important question. The seasonal coronavirus, you don't. And you after a year, you can get reinfected with the same strain. But of course, that's a mild upper respiratory infection. This is a very severe infection. And our hope is that we're going to be able to get long and durable protection against this virus. But the only way to know that is to do the science. Coming up. I just got back from my 38-week appointment. Pregnant during a pandemic. If I get COVID now, I won't be able to be there for the birth of my child. First time parents facing up to fears before the big day. On this Mother's Day, there's lots of virtual hugging going on. Everyone is longing for the day when we can get close again. For those women who are pregnant right now, motherhood is about to get very real. Babies, of course, don't wait around for a crisis to subside. What is it like to be expecting in the midst of all of this? Well, we're following a couple who are due to have their first baby in just a few days. They've been documenting their journey of what to expect when you are expecting during a pandemic. I'm Kareen. And I'm Eli. And we're having a baby in the time of coronavirus. It's true. We met four years ago while I was out in Vancouver for work. I was living in Toronto, she was living in Vancouver, so we did the long distance thing for a while, bouncing back and forth between the two cities. A big part of our lives and our relationship is traveling and adventures. Whether it's camping in a Westie, exploring new countries, or just going for a hike, we love getting outside and trying new things. So when we found out last fall we were pregnant, we were pretty pumped to embark on this new adventure. We were in Ontario at the time, and things started off fairly normal. Doctor's visits. This is what you look like at 19 weeks. Hanging out with friends and family. We headed back west in January. We even went on a baby moon to Palm Springs. Toured around on bikes. Hills on cruiser bikes, not so easy. Green. Killing it up there. She's biking for two. Explored Joshua Tree, lounged in the pools. Life was good. But after we got back, things started to change pretty quickly. The reality is that the number of people affected by the virus around the globe keeps climbing. Coronavirus was becoming more of a thing, and people were starting to talk about it. It started with little things, like no more high fives at volleyball. Then an environmental conference I was to attend in Vegas got canceled. And the next thing you know, things started shutting down. I was really excited for my sister to come visit in March, but we had to cancel her trip. 
Questions started being raised about our healthcare options as we entered the third trimester. And our day-to-day -day shifted as everyone started isolating. Can we go to the hospital? Is the hospital even safe? What if we get sick? Can the baby get COVID? Can my mom still Will come? Will our baby classes be canceled? Mom friends? What does this, this mean financially? How long is this going to last? Where do we go from here? There are a lot of questions, and to most, the answer was unknown. Does it stress you out that I can't come to the appointments in person? No. The first time definitely was a little bit more intense because it was our first appointment during COVID. So the midwives were wearing masks. There was no one else in the waiting room. It just had a totally different feel. But now that we've done it a few times um, and you can still participate and call in and ask questions and hear our updates, it's okay. So like everyone, we had to trust in the experts, stay at home and focus on what we can control. Like makeshift grocery masks. I don't have a real mask, so I'm using my ski mask to cover my face just as an attempt to make it a little bit safer. I got my hand sanitizer, I got my Lysol wipes. The reality is we're 39 weeks in, and if I get COVID now, I won't be able to be there for the birth of my child, which would suck. So, ski masks up, let's get some peppers. And washing everything that came in the house, just in case. It'd be nice to have Elias announce the sex of the baby and cut the cord. We wrote our birth wish list. It'd be nice if we have a hospital birth to be able to come back here quickly. Yeah. In order to pull that. Sure, we can do that. <laughs> we installed the car seat. Dad life. We tried to stay active with workouts and going to the beach. Our social life moved online. We took our own maternity photos. I started wrapping up work, and we joined an online group with other expecting parents. I just got back from my 38 week appointment. We took a baby class online, and I joined our midwife appointments from my phone. <laughs> Through it all, we were blessed with love and support from friends and family. They kept us grounded and helped us celebrate this new chapter. A friend made us a quilt. I can't believe it. My cousin Steph made us a mobile, and loved ones spoiled us with hand-me-downs and thoughtful gifts. They even planned a surprise shower over Zoom. Who did that? Oh, just all of my eyes. I heard someone say the other day, we're all in the same storm, but we're in different boats. And I think that is so true. We've been blessed with a healthy pregnancy, and because we are in BC at the moment, our birth options are pretty stable. We could still have our midwives and our doula, and I can still attend the birth, but for many, that's not the case. Everybody's situation is different, and everyone handles things differently. This isn't really what I pictured for the end of our pregnancy. There have been disappointments and tears, but at the end of the day, we are okay, and we have so much to be grateful for. We don't know what the future holds, especially during this pandemic. Things could go totally sideways at a moment's notice. But for now, we're just gonna try and make the most of things. Soak it all in because this baby will be here before we know it. Next on The New Reality. It can be like kind of an emotional roller coaster. Rising to the challenge. So this is what I made. Oh, nicely done. How isolation is breeding new bakers in many Canadian families. Staying home and staying inside means many of us are discovering skills we never knew we had, many of them in the kitchen. For some reason, baking bread has become a big thing. Flour has been flying off the shelves and is being kneaded into dough by novice bakers across the country. Our Mike Drolet is one of them, and we asked him to explore what it is about bread and baking it from scratch that's become the perfect pandemic pastime. There's something in the way bread makes us feel. Fresh out of the oven, a pat of butter melting in the first cut. Studies have shown the aroma of fresh bread makes us happy, kinder, which isn't a bad thing considering where the world is at right now. Even in defeat, there's a certain satisfaction at having tried. Um, I've been doing this since like seven this morning, the folding thing, and it's still like this. No doubt she did some searches online for baking. She wouldn't be alone. Google Trends shows that by the first week of April, Canadians were asking how to bake 10 times more than normal. 
That's when Emily Oven, okay, her last name is actually Hoven, began a popular thread called How to Make Sourdough at the End of the World, which is clearly a bit dramatic, but less so when you hear her talk about bread. It can be like kind of an emotional roller coaster. People don't get like the consistent rising that they're maybe hoping for. Um, but usually if you just like show up for it every day, keep feeding it, it'll, it'll be fine after a few weeks. So just keep going. <laughs> And so many of us did with various degrees of success. For every golden, crusty loaf, there were 10 fails like this. But slowly, we started to get better at it, allowing home bakers like Abtin Azarpaju to share the wealth. But I think it's actually helping me uh, uh, become a bit more popular amongst my friends because now like, I'll just do a big batch and put it in like a bag for a friend and then We'll just drop it off. Over the past century, homemade bread went from being a staple to a luxury. Let's face it, who had the time to bake before? In many ways, this pandemic has created the perfect conditions to try new things. Isolation has taken away so much, yet it's given me two new family members. There's Magnus the Pug and this, a 20 kilo bag of flour. Anybody who's done any baking knows just how glorious it is. And if I need to explain, baking ingredients, most notably flour, sold out early and have been very slow to get restocked. In fact, we reached out to some independent flour mills to talk about demand. Only one agreed to speak on the condition of anonymity. Seriously. So we animated the conversation. I can't handle any promotion right now, he told us. I'm only filling 60% of my orders I can't keep up. So you're running out of flour, I asked? No, he said, still stressed out. I have enough flour. I'm running out of bags. And yet, it's the run on yeast that has led to the most confusing of conversations. How old is your starter? My starter? What do you mean? The starter, as Baker Extraordinaire and Food Network Canada star Anna Olson pointed out to me, is necessary for anybody who can't procure yeast to make dough rise. It's flour, water, and the time to allow it to ferment and create a natural yeast. That said, the bread I made with store-bought yeast garnered rave reviews. So this is what I made. Oh, nicely done. I'm impressed, Mike. My Dutch oven loaf, so painstakingly made over six hours of kneading and rising and baking, has now been validated by none other than Anna Olson. Oh, it's all about the crust, isn't it? And what she says about her craft makes sense. Baking is a family affair. Just as ingredients measured together just so can make the perfect cake, getting the right mix of anything in a bowl is the recipe for a happy household. Young families, she says, are asking her about croissants, pancakes, waffles, and cookies. It jumps up to making French macaron, making mm. fondant covered cake like your wife is doing. Um, it's, it's that next level of decor. So there's a big leap. And even it, it, and if you've never baked before, starting with French macaron will but be a bit of a challenge. One worth taking on, provided the ingredients are available. But I suspect more Canadians today will rise to the challenge. Coming up, sustaining the line. Yeah. The growing cross-country support for small businesses and frontline workers. And finally, an update to a story we brought you a few weeks ago on the new reality. It's about businesses helping local restaurants stay afloat by teaming them up with donors who cover the costs of making meals to feed frontline health care workers. The Canadian group is called Sustain the Line, and since our report aired, they've had so many offers from generous donors. They're now in 19 cities across the U.S. and Canada, where it's truly a national effort spanning Halifax to Fort McMurray. Sustain the Line has helped 100 independent businesses stay alive by helping them deliver more than 10,000 meals. And this Canadian group now has international interests to expand their work into Berlin, Rome, Paris, London, and other cities. Food and generosity, obviously, a powerful combination. Well, on this Mother's Day, when all we want to do is give our moms a hug, many are finding new ways to embrace their mother. Four siblings who live in different places across Canada have found a way, and they've made it a treasured part of their daily routine. Thanks for watching. I got a brand new pair of rose skates, you got a brand new key. 
my alarm goes off at 10 o'clock every day. So I phone her pretty much every day at that time. And we usually play music. I feel very blessed because uh, all four kids are very loving. Paul, uh, well, he plays the guitar and sings too. Uh, but mostly we'll talk about the beautiful landscape and we see where he's living. Lorraine, my daughter, reads to me. Now traditions were being honored again. She can't see to read it herself, so I am happy to read it for her. That's one little thing that I can do for her right now when I can't go visit her and bring her her favorite foods that she likes. We whistle. We whistle and uh, have a good chuckle over if you can get a whistle out or not. I just want my mom to know that she's cherished and the things that she's done will just live forever through her kids and her grandkids. I have a dream, I will come true, that you're here with me.